Hello, welcome to Eyewitness Report on Channels Television. Today on the show, we present to you the story of a 24-year-old Nigerian, Jerry Malo, who through his creative exploit, building agro-machineries, has demonstrated the need for the country to pay some level of attention to technical and vocational education, which appears to have suffered relegation in recent past. Come with me to Jaws, Plateau State, Nigeria. I am Chris Elam. Well, this tractor fascinates me, and you may wonder why. Well, it is put together by some young Nigerians here in Jos, led by 24-year-old Jerry Malo. Plateau State derives its name from the Jos Plateau with boundaries of elevated hills surrounding virtually the entire plateau itself. It's a melting pot of the best of natural endowments, such as rafts, water bodies, and a near-temperate climate. <laughs> These factors all come together in creating a vegetation suitable for the cultivation of a wide range of agricultural produce. So while the plateau is known for these and more, not much is told of its technical hub. However, one young man appears set to tell that story. I'm Jerry Isaac Malu. I was born in Jos Plateau State in a little town called Bukos. Um, I attended the King's School, Ghana Rock, for my primary level. And I went to boys' secondary school, Gindri. While Jerry's classmates busy themselves with trying to understand the theoretical aspect of their coursework, he could not be bothered as he kept his eyes on learning the technical and practical part of his school program. In my class two, I... I got a new science teacher, and my new science teacher was very passionate about practicals too. If we did motion, he would bring a tire or something and just teach us to practicalize it. So there was a time we, we did a particular topic, and he brought cartons, electric motors, batteries, and tried to make something for us in class. He made a small vehicle. The vehicle was run, the tires were rolling when he lifted it up. But once he drops it, it wasn't rolling. So I, I dedicated my time and all my efforts to make sure that I make one and made sure that it was also running. So I stressed him after the lessons. He gave me more lessons on it and he supported me in different ways. Till the point where I was able to make mine in class three, I made a very small toy car working with remotes and batteries. So the passion kept growing from there till my secondary school level. At secondary school, I was most at times the last person in the class or maybe second to the last. It's like whenever my mates were collecting results, I was I cared less of my results because I knew my position already. It's not like I don't read. I read very well, but I find it difficult to comprehend the theoretical aspect. But when we go to the lab, I find myself teaching others how to do the practical aspects of it. So from my GS3, I joined the JET and Science Club in my school, and we started representing the school in so many science competitions. This led him to assemble all he could find to build his first car which brought him some level of exposure and eventually a scholarship to study engineering at Hale Foucher University. My parents are farmers, so raising the, the funds to build that was a big challenge for me. I had to farm, save my earnings from the farm, and use it to build that. So uh, I, I preferred spending any little change I had on that prototype than buying myself shoes or buying clothing. I just had in mind that if I'm able to achieve this, one day I'll grow rich, I'll grow big, and I'll be able to buy myself nice clothes. So I just sacrificed for that time, and I built the vehicle, 
And I can remember playing with, around with it with my friend. It was something I just did out of fun. I just did that out of pleasure. So I called my friends to see the maximum number of people that the car could move with. I remember about over 10 people climbed the car. There was no chair, no seat. So we're just basically standing and just hugging ourselves. And I was the driver sitting down and driving. And the car was still moving. So people would be running after us and then maybe the seventh person would jump on the car and it was still moving. The eighth person would jump. The tenth person would jump and the car was still moving. So I was really pushing. I actually wanted to practicalize what I learned. I just don't want it to be that I know how this works. I know how to do this. I wanted to do it myself. So I, I used the grinding machine engine, the normal engine, they start with a rope. So I used it as the engine behind and I was modeling a Lamborghini Gallardo. It was my dream car as of then. It, it motivated me a lot. I studied at University of Hertfordshire in London, which I read automotive engineering. I am so passionate about vehicles, so I was learning how to make vehicles. But sticking back to my background, and my major challenge has been performing in the academical aspect. So I was still finding it difficult. They are, rather, in the university, it became worse. I was doing statistics, which was mathematics. I was doing computer programming, which was almost fully mathematics. I was doing the normal mathematics. I was doing programming, which was mathematics too. So I, I got discouraged. Though I, was, I had access to the practical aspects, I was doing, I was involved in some sort of practical teamwork we're doing. There's a competition organized in Europe for automotive students. Each school, each university make um, a Formula 1 vehicle and we come together and compete. So there they test the fuel economy, the balancing, the braking, the speed and so many other things. And my team was the best. That was in the year 2014. My team was the best in Europe. So um, I, felt, I felt achieved. I felt, yeah, it was a, a big leap for me. But just to be honest, I didn't see much difference with the little car I had made back in Nigeria. I felt I needed more. And to get more, I had to be in the fields. I had to be in the factories where they were making these vehicles. Armed with the knowledge he had gathered in the UK and a strong belief in his dream and his ability to excel, Jerry Muller returned to Nigeria. It was a decision that unsettled everyone around him, considering the vast opportunities abroad that he forfeited. At that point, it was... It, my coming back to Nigeria brought a lot of controversies and a lot of issues for me. My parents were not in support at all. You know, it's like going to London and coming back to Nigeria. I was doing a student job, which I was paid equivalent of about 360,000 Naira every month. So to my parents, it was, it was an achievement already. Even if I don't want to school, I should just stay there and work. And I was saying, no, I wanted to come back to Nigeria. So actually, it was a challenge for me. It was a difficulty. I just had to stand my ground and come back. Not only for my parents, for the person who, which was touched, the person who sponsored me to London. He saw what I was doing, and he was willing to support me to get to the, to the better level I needed to be. And me leaving my education halfway now wasn't sounding encouraging to him. It was a big challenge to him. So... He was very, very unhappy and unpleased with my decision. I even cried, thinking, how can my son go to study abroad and then come back without finishing his studies? And I felt, how will I work in the society? People will be saying, my son went to London and he was unable to make it and he came back, as if he was withdrawn. So I was confused. When people say, ah, they saw Jerry, I would say, okay, yes, he is back. It was not actually pleasing to an extent that, uh, not that I was not happy that he went to, for studies, but I was not happy in the sense that he had no take-off capital. He had no take-off machines. So he still had to be running Helter Skelter like somebody who doesn't even have the knowledge or the technical know-how because there was no money and the government was not ready to support. We are not even saying government should give him anything, but government should make a level playing ground for him to operate. The lesson was bitter, but in the long run made a better Jerry Mallow.
I looked around in Nigeria. People who fail in academics and perform well in the practical aspect are not considered to be first-class citizens in a way. Truth be told, carpenters are not really valued in the society. Um, mechanics are not really valued. There's a way they are downgraded. So I felt, why not invite these people? Why not invite people who are faced with such challenge? So we'll team up and create a platform for ourselves where we could feed ourselves and give ourselves some value. An hour, 19 minute drive from the city center is Bokos, where it all started for him and where he settled down upon his return from the UK. Everything I do now all started from here before it grew to where it is now. So come with me. So in this workshop is where I spent most of my time. It has been locked for a very long while now, so you should expect to see cobwebs and all that. It has been very inactive. I spent, I spent most of my time, my three hours, in here. Yeah, you're welcome. It doesn't, it doesn't really look nice, but this room has a lot of stories in my life. Jerry changed his story by channeling his energy to building agro machineries. He brought people of like minds and passion together, which led to the birth of Benny Agro. Then we came up with the idea of building a company. That was where the name Benny came from. And Benny in my dialect, my local dialect, means knowledge. So I just wanted it to, to be a platform where knowledgeable people bring their ideas together, make a living out of the ideas, and solve problems in the society. So I started inviting my friends, calling one, of my, one or two of my friends that I knew who were faced with same, similar challenges with me. Then my closest friend came in. One of those who probably understood Jerry and believed in him, even while the road was rough, is an old friend, a photographer and cinematographer, Andy Chantu, who offered him his service. When he came back from the UK, he told me about his challenges and what he faced, and this is the, the whole story and predicament. I was like, hey, we've been together since all this while, and I knew you since when we were like in, when you were in JS1 and things like that. So I followed his uh, dream of creating this company, doing his fabrications. I made sure I put in my own part. I wasn't good in mechanical aspects because mine, my discipline at that time was electrical and electronics. So I focused on supporting him in the administrative side, writing business proposals, business plans, documenting cash flow, uh, maintaining social media, taking photos, making videos to promote products and things like that because those are things that I was naturally endowed with talents to do. Four years down the line, the story is different. They now churn out various agro equipment manually from this workshop in a backyard at Ray Feet Jaws. When they're not on the field building agro machineries, they're brainstorming on new designs and techniques to build them. This hole is able to make the hole to be bigger and more. Okay, to be bigger and more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I decided to come here for my Simon's one that's industrial attachment. So far, I've spent about four weeks and I'm really learning a lot here. It's really um, improving my innovative side. I think it should really be encouraged because from what I've been seeing, people here don't just do it for the money. Like They really have passion. They want to see a difference being made. And I feel it will help our economy because instead of importing all these machines, we can make them here. We have green boxes. We have very intelligent and creative people. So. 
the government should really invest in this farm. Yeah. I'm a graduate of mechanical engineering, and then I came to this place meeting a lot of young people. Uh, and this place is actually a pro the perfect place for someone to develop his talents because the people around here don't actually laugh at your faults. They, we actually work together as a team to make sure you become a better person, become who you actually want to be. We don't laugh at whatsoever you do. You just bring your idea, no matter how small or uh, incomplete it is. We work together as a team to make sure it becomes uh, a full form idea at the end of the day. I am suggesting that um, I am suggesting that instead of the flanges on the side, we should do something um, maybe a short flange this way. When the designs are set for production, Jerry sources all his materials from a metal market in Jaws. So this is where we get, we, are, we source our materials for any metallic parts, the stainless parts, the tubes, the pipes, the stainless sheets we get, we virtually get almost everything from here. So um, just take you around. Um, good evening, sir. Good evening, yeah. well done, sir. Well done, how is, how is the market, sir? How is the work? Very fine, sir, we bless you. Thank you, sir. Um, so he owns, he owns this place and we get from him. We've, we've been transacting business with him for about five years now. And for virtually everything we need for materials we don't get from him, he easily gets it available and make it available for us. Despite efforts being put into building agro-machineries locally, most farmers still carry out a large chunk of the activities manually. Presently, I have just finished weeding potato yesterday, and today I am presently supplying mess. What I mean by supplying mess is that I planted two weeks ago, but there is a poor germination, so I had to now supply the ones that are missing. And this is done manually. In fact, right from the morning, I have been doing this work. If it were a machine, I would have done it in 30 minutes. So in all these operations that I'm saying, everything is still done manually, or we are using the human effort. We don't have machines. In fact, the only thing that we are able to do mechanical is the primary operation. That is the plowing, harrowing, and ridging, and nothing else. Planting is done manually within manually and even harvesting is done manually. One agency that supports the growth and development of SMEs in the state is the Plasmeda. To understand the state government's position in supporting innovation, we had a chat with the Director General, Hagai Gutap, who says the government gives people like Jerry Malu adequate attention. At the time we met with Jerry, it was almost close to the um, time that we were to host the uh, M M nationwide MSME clinic on the plateau. And I felt that the technology that he has needs to be really um, showcased to the world so that people will know that we have, uh, we have um, a breakthrough in technology on the plateau. And from there, we went to the extent of, okay, seeing how he can standardize his products to be able to withstand the test of time. And uh, at that time, he had uh, some challenges of, uh, of course, making these things work as he wants because he was limited by funding. So the government was able to really come into assisting him by providing uh, all the needed uh, parts that he needed to make the tractor work very well. And I could remember very well, he was constructing a rice mill. So we said, okay, as a, a mark of um, patronage, the government gave him money to complete the rice mill so that he could be able to showcase it too. So you can see that at that time, we were monitoring him to ensure that he works efficiently and produce according to uh, standards. 
before uh, the MSME clinic, even after, the government was able to even uh, select some outstanding 50 MSMs on the plateau for further exhibition to Abuja, whereby they were able to showcase their products further, and that exposed them to um, both local and international uh, partners who are doing business with them right uh, at the moment. And uh, I think it was at that point that the, the Jerry really caught the attention of the federal government. So you can see that these are some of the supports that the government have given him. So we are trying to now set up what we call an industrial park, whereby we will provide shared facility for all these SMEs uh, that are into uh, the same industry, so that we'll be able to reduce the cost of their production. In 2018, Jerry Marlow's venture, Benny Agro, won the Nigeria MSME Awards. Someday, Jerry hopes to build cars for the country as he gets set to launch one of his prototypes. His quest for solution makes him push boundaries. And with the right investment, Benny Agro can turn the fortunes of more local farmers around. Once I'm done with the design process, I, uh, I am supposed to, in an ideal situation, send uh, the, the file to a numerical control machine so that it can, get, uh, it can be caught in uh, for the process. But then that does not happen here well, because we do not have the funds or the machines to go through with that process. So whatever I do on my computer, we end up just printing it on paper and then drawing the whole thing with our hands on this piece of metal before we get to cutting. So I think the government has an important role to play here. They can actually get to uh, put more funds and pay more attention into these uh, innovations we are undertaking so we can improve and get better machines to accommodate, better, to create better machines at the end of the day. The story of Jerry Malu presents many lessons to learn. In fact, I used to advise women like me. When there is a problem, when somebody shared his own condition with me, I will say, the destiny of everyone, every person is in the hands of God. Jerry, and then when the, the, the child is still growing, keep watching what he is doing. In fact, he, 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 when he was uh, still small, he used to gather this small, small, rubbish zinc to make cars, different cars. And anytime they give him gift, he will say, mommy, keep it for me, I will buy a big car. And when he grew and he started doing this thing, I knew that it was, that was his destiny. And I used to tell my fellow women, don't rebuke your children when they are making this uh, play, play, play. At least pay attention to see what your child wants to do. And then let's be uh, praying for our children that what their destiny is, will come to, to pass. My message for the um, academical aspect is there should be a way to, re, to encourage the practical aspect, to encourage people who are good with their hands. I feel they shouldn't be considered as second class citizens. They shouldn't be downgraded because they don't perform in the academical aspect. I feel there should be more encouragement, there should be more embracement to them towards those kind of people. and. Um, to parents, you should please let your child go towards the dream, go towards his passion. I, I am pleased begging at this point that you should not enforce a particular kind of job to your child. Let him go towards what makes him happy and let him build on what he's good at. It makes a lot of things easier for him. There is nothing more further from the truth than to believe the nation can become a world player without paying attention to science and technology, human capital development, and of course, these gifted ones. The trajectory, therefore, would be to seek out these gifted ones 
and of course help them hone their skills and own their space. That would be a great start to a new era. And don't forget we can keep the conversation going on all of our social media platforms showing on your screen. Till next week, Eyewitness Report makes a return. I'll keep my eyes on you. Bye-bye.